No, you guys don't understand. Like, I have to wear bone graduation speech. It's crazy to think that I still have the moralist. Welcome to Fan Take. The series where we'll be breaking down different fandoms and their impact on the advertising industry. Each episode will bring in a different agency member to give their take on a fandom they're a part of. And talk about opportunities for that fandom in the advertising and marketing world. Now, this episode's a little different because instead of bringing a guest in to talk about their fandom, Mackenzie and I will be breaking down fangirl behavior misconceptions, the impacts of fandom on the economy, and a look at how fans have the power to influence change, especially in the concert buying experience. So just some quick intros. My name's Mackenzie. I'm a fourth year advertising major, and I'm also the media department manager at the agency. Um, the main fandoms that I'm a part of are Harry Styles, obviously. Um, I'm, I also grew up a huge Directioner, huge One Direction fan from the start. Um, and I'm also a fan of different music artists like Conan Gray, Olivia Rodrigo, Joshua Bassett, you know, different TV shows here and there, but I would say the main fandoms are for Mr. Styles right here. And I'm Jenny. I am currently getting my master's in marketing and I'm an operations manager here at the agency. Same fandoms as Mackenzie, Harry, One Direction, a few other artists here and there. I'm big Marvel fan, a little bit in the sports world, but not that much, mostly Harry and One Direction. Okay, so let's just get into the conversation. I think a good place to start is conventions just because I think that they're a perfect example of um, fandoms bringing together a community of people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's crazy how much they impact the economy. And so San Diego Comic-Con, which is one of the biggest ones, um, brings in over $165 million to this, the city of San Diego. <laughs> That's a lot of money. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm an event management minor, so I've taken some classes about like conventions and tourism and all that. So I'm like a bit familiar with how they work. Um, not super familiar with the different types, but I know there's so many. Like you said, Comic-Con, but also like TV shows and, you know, music and just different band. Like you can have a convention for literally anything. Yeah. There's people are fans of everything. And yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it really is a part of tourism. And that is a huge impact for, you know, a city. And yeah, $165 million. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you talk about tourism. My roommate and I, she's a big uh, uh, Vampire Diaries fan. We went to like the city where like the set, like where they filmed oh, the Vampire yeah. Diaries. So it's gotta be a huge, like for like tourism has to be huge there. They just did a convention there with like the cast and uh, like a whole like weekend. Um, and same thing with One Tree Hill. They did a whole weekend wherever One Tree Hill is filmed. Yeah. They did a charity basketball game. Like so much in that week, packed in that weekend. And it was great for like super fans because you get to meet the people playing the characters that you love. Um, you get the chance to ask questions to the director about the show and yeah. just like interact and have that community, not only with the other people who are fans of it, but with like the actors or the artists or whoever themselves, which is yeah. really great for conventions. Yeah. I feel like this is kind of going to be a common theme of this whole episode. And yeah. just fandoms in general is a, the sense of community that it brings. Um, but truly like in conventions, like, it's mutually beneficial. The fans want to get that insight from their favorite celebrities, actors, whoever, but like the celebrities also want to feel closer to their fans and get that connection. So it's yeah. totally like a two-way street. Um, Jenny, I know you're a big fan of sports. I know you can kind of speak really well into how sports fans, how women sports fans are treated, yeah. how the sports fandom of just anything is kind of how it runs. Um, and you're really big into like football. Football right? is mine, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would say college football is probably the, the one I'm the most into and that's because I'm a college student, but I was also raised a Gator fan. So um, like growing up, I watched Gator games, but because of my research background, I had to look into how much money the NFL brings in. Classic um, researcher move. <laughs> just the classic researcher <laughs> in me. Um, but just looking at jersey sales alone, um, the NFL jerseys were reported to have brought in over $2 billion in revenue in 2021. Billion. With a B. <laughs> that was a, with a B. A with a billion B. dollars, um, which is kind of insane because that's just jerseys and that's like merchandise for football. And so like even that, like those sales are like impacting yeah. um, the economy and like whatever cities they're in. And it's helping the players because the players get paid a little bit commission on, on okay. jersey sales. Um, but the team's at large and everything. So. Yeah, that is fan merch right there. That is fan which merch. Which is kind of funny to like make the connection between the two. Because yeah. I feel like they're so different. And people treat buying a jersey. Or, I mean, if you're a fan, you want to buy merch for whoever you like. But those the people who are not in that fandom, they see, you know, you buying a fan shirt or a hoodie or something else like that as like a waste of money yeah. or something. And, you know, if that same person is saying that, but they're in a a sports fandom yeah. or whatever and they're buying a jersey they don't see it that way and it's just kind of yeah it's definitely interesting <laughs> because it is merch it is it is what you enjoy and it's what um 
it's supporting a player or a team that you really love. Um, and a lot of times that can get like passed down. I think we just don't view them the same. And I know that's, uh, it, it probably is rooted in misogyny um, because fandoms are mostly girls um, mm -hmm. and sports. It's like, well, the game changes every time. Like we're playing a new team every time. Um, but I mean, we've talked about this. I went to New York to see Harry Styles this time around and I went to Chicago and he had a different opening act. Um, and this is not just going for Harry Styles. Like I know a lot of artists do this. They have different yeah. outfits. They probably change up the songs here and there. I personally don't really know because I'm not a part of them, but I can just imagine. Um, so yeah, it's not the same show every time. Maybe it's similar, but even the way that the artist performs the song may yeah. be different. And you're with a different group of people. It's a different vibe, but mm -hmm. the community aspect is still there. So yeah, yeah. And there was a girl that I saw a TikTok of that was talking about how like when she has an album that she really enjoys, like you listen to it a lot because it's like a comfort to you to listen to that. Yeah. Or if you have a food that you really like, you're going to go back and eat that food. That's your comfort food right. or a restaurant that you really enjoy, you know, or clothing, whatever. And so like, why don't like that can be the same thing for a concert, you know, like you really love this concert. It brings you comfort to be at that at that venue at that show with that artist performing like why would you not want to go and see it multiple times even if it's the same show like you're listening to the same music all the time why would you not want to listen to it performed live yeah all the time? so to me i was like whoa like that yeah. makes sense as to like why we want to see the same artist perform again and again because we listen to their music over and over again so but kind of going back to like the sense of community which and i kind of wanted to bring this up because i thought this was a really interesting point but at the harry Styles show during treat people with kindness this one fan or like a couple fans, they started this thing called like the boot scoot. And now everyone does it at every single Harry show. Yeah. And everyone knows it if they're in the pit. And it's just this dance and you just see this group of people doing this one dance that a fan made. Like, yeah. how does that even happen? Um, but yeah, I thought that was really cool. And it's kind of similar. That became kind of like a tradition um, for that one song. And I know at Gator Games, we have like the won't back down, right? I've only been to a few Gator mm -hmm. Games, I will Yeah, say. won't back down, we are the boys. Yeah. yeah, so that is a moment in the set <laughs> of like the game where people are like shoulder to shoulder, like singing That's and true. dancing. Yeah. And it's like, it's a tradition of each game. And it's so similar, like the parallels are crazy. Artists have that just as like sports fans do. Yeah. But not to talk about TikTok again, but we are, very TikTok generation. Yeah. Um, I did see a girl talking about sports fans versus musician, fan, like mus fans of musicians on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And she basically, like her point was like, if people categorize fangirls as crazy, they should be categorizing sports fans as crazy, but you really shouldn't be considering any of them crazy. Like the point of it is like, people should be able to love what they love in that sense of like, where their community is, like where their, where their like family is. Yeah. And like, just like, we don't consider sports fans crazy, we shouldn't be considering fangirls crazy because yeah. it's like the same thing. That's just like where you feel like you belong mm -hmm. and where you like find your community of people. And yeah. so people should just be able to enjoy. Let people be happy. <laughs> yeah. What's so wrong with that, you yeah. know? I remember, do you remember like in the One Direction movie there, they bring in this doctor or yeah. like this like, uh, this, this like science, yeah, yeah, something like that. They evaluate the brain <laughs> of like a fangirl or something, but it kind of addresses in that movie how you know, they're not like they they explain how they're seen as crazy and hysterical. But the psychologist goes on to say, like, they're not crazy. They're just excited. Like, yeah. they're just happy. I've had friends come to me and be like, yeah, I like didn't want to be in it because I didn't want people to think I was like some crazy fangirl in middle school. And they'll say like they yeah. pushed away like the One Direction thing because they didn't want to be seen as like a crazy fangirl. It's like, why? Which is <laughs> kind of crazy because, I mean, they broke records. They're, they they sh like shattered records during their time. I mean, exactly. so like the, it was the female fans of the Beatles that catapulted them to fame, and then their music started being taken seriously when men said it was good music. Mm. But like we see them now as like icons. Like, of yeah. course the Beatles have make great music. Like, yeah. wh why would you even say otherwise? So it's weird to think that it took men reporting on it and listening to it for it to like become a thing. Yeah, that <laughs> is actually insane. And I mean, fangirls really do have the power and the impact to completely change a celebrity's life. Like yeah. without them, the celebrity wouldn't be famous. Simply. It's not a music industry. They would just be a girls. person yeah. who's trying to like make art, but who's gonna be at their shows? No one, they're yeah. not making money. So like, it's kind of, they're actually crucial to them as an artist. Yeah. But yeah, also kind of going into how fangirls are kind of like a huge part of making money and all that. Um, a lot of people have made careers for themselves because of, yeah. you know, 
their fan accounts or anything like that. Which is, like, obviously a dream for me. <laughs> that would be the best thing ever. Yeah. As if, like, you could make a career out of that. Yeah. You said there was a girl that you follow on TikTok. Yeah, her name is 32 Mia. She, so she had, back in, like, I think when the One Direction days, like, so 2012, somewhere around there, she had a fan account on Twitter, I believe, um, with, like, hundreds of thousands of followers. And so she was essentially a social media manager. So she understands how to get engagement and, you know, foster a sense of community and she was basically already being a professional. Um, And so now she works for Universal Music Group and she's kind of like a professional fangirl. Like she's going to concerts and like award shows. Yeah, it's crazy. And living the dream. Like, I can only imagine. And she has like 28,000 followers on TikTok now. She talks a lot about her experience of like how she got to that place. Mm -hmm. So super inspirational. And I mean, yeah, that's just really cool. Obviously her experience as a fan got her there i mean you yeah. even have people that like are interested in like concert photography like amy marie photo on, yeah. on uh, twitter who shot this picture that's on the cover of a time, time magazine. magazine um but like she goes to a bunch of concerts for a bunch of musicians and her goal is to become like a concert photographer and, and the fact that like time magazine reached out to her and that's was like crazy. hey can we use your picture on the cover the like cover. that's insane and yeah. it's because she, like she took this photo just to like go and like build out her portfolio it had nothing to do and because she likes her styles and likes taking pictures i know and it turned into like a money-making opportunity for her and then of course the one and only Brittany Brittany broski (laughs) um perfect example of a fangirl who has made it forbes 30 under 30 forbes 30 under 30 are Are you you kidding like she's met her faves like she she got to go backstage and like run the hshq yeah for the listeners, Harry Styles is headquarters, headquarters on Instagram, like account, yeah, um, and like did it behind the scenes, and everyone was so excited that it was her. Everyone was yeah. like, "Yes, Britney." We like, were all first, like keeping you know? up with it, like, "Oh, if she if she meets Harry Styles, she's gonna lose it." Yeah. Like, I'm gonna cry. I literally did cry. Yeah, when I saw the video on Twitter of her meeting Harry Styles, I bawled. I literally <laughs> sobbed for like. 10 minutes it was so cool because it felt like i met harry yeah. like which is so weird like i don't know why it but feels she's that not way. like unashamed to like talk about the things that she's a fan of yeah and for a lot of it it's like given her these opportunities we went on the podcast the off the top podcast which you Shameless should go listen plug. to is the agency's <laughs> podcast but we talk about like Aroda and the kind of like easter eggs that harry dropped that the fans really discovered it was super like subtle not obvious but that is what inspired me to like go to want to get a job in the music industry and like marketing and creative marketing experiential marketing anything like that um because that had that all happened when i was a freshman in college still kind of figuring out what i wanted to do yeah and so it kind of like you know inspired my path from there but yeah yeah i would say I, like, always knew I grew up wanting to go into marketing, but I would say, like, I'm drawn to musicians who do that kind of stuff, like Harry and Taylor, um, with their marketing, because it's just so cool. I mean, I literally just did a whole project about Taylor Swift's Midnight thing as a successful marketing campaign. It was really Um, good, I will say. So, it was a good project, and and it it is inspiring, like, as someone going into the field to, like, see all the creative things that, that... these these artists and their teams are doing to promote an album and how can we like take that and transfer it for me into like selling pet food but like you know like it's it's cool to like see what they're doing and how that's going to trans I think that's going to translate across the industry at large like not just in music but it's going to transfer to the movies and then also into like just general marketing I mean we talked about like what brands can do like what brands can take take away from like these artists and that's like getting your your fans involved and getting like exactly um, so I'm not a huge, like, I'm not a Swifty, but I do, like, kind of keep up with Taylor Swift here and there. Yeah. I like her music. She makes good music. She's a great musician. But, Ginny, I know you are a pretty big Taylor Swift fan. You at least know everything that's happening. Um, specifically, you were there for the whole Ticketmaster debacle. <laughs> yes. experienced it firsthand um in the office trying to buy <laughs> these tickets there's some photographic evidence of that <laughs> there is there's a lot because it was kind of it was a stressful day i will say yeah. but if you wanted to kind of like talk about that cause... yeah that was probably um one of i wouldn't well it was the worst day of my life but it was a very stressful day of my life um so if you don't know 
Ticketmaster basically messed up the entire sale for Taylor Swift's um, newest tour. So basically they sent out pre-sale codes um, and people got on the site. The site crashed before people could even join the waiting room, which is like before you can even get in the line at, on Ticketmaster. I like wasn't logged in at first. My sister and my sister-in-law work. They get in, they get in the line eventually. It says they're 2000 plus and I'm like, well, shoot. But then I'm like, it's a stadium tour. Like you're yeah. still gonna be able to get seats. Like there's yeah. 80,000 seats in the stadium. <laughs> I'm like texting my sister for, throughout the day. I'm like, is it moving? Is it moving? And she was like, I mean, I would say I'm at like 15%, but I've been stuck here for half an hour. Well, she works a full-time job, so she cannot be sitting on that. So we stupidly switched over to my computer, which pushed us back further in line, mm. but whatever. And then I sat there for seven hours waiting to get into- <laughs> Quite literally. But I, what I forgot to mention actually was that the code stopped working. So that was the whole, they had to pause the line because their code stopped working. Yeah. It was like probably the craziest ticket purchasing experience in my yeah. life. Like, I thought getting Harry tickets was bad and stressful. Like this is insane. Um, <laughs> A walk in the park. <laughs> <laughs> then they had the Capital One sale. That went, I think, a little bit smoother. It might have also frozen, but a lot smoother. Like, people were, like, within three hours, like, those tickets had sold out. So, like, a lot smoother. And then they were supposed to have a general sale on that Friday. Mm -hmm. And they, like, canceled the general sale because they didn't have enough tickets to sell. And this is Ticketmaster. Yeah. Like, a, like that is your job to sell concert tickets. Your name is Ticketmaster. Yeah. Where are the tickets? <laughs> yeah. Like, and, like, it's a monopoly. Like, they have, like... Like, it's their thing. Like, you don't buy tickets from anywhere else. Like, you right. basically only purchase tickets from Ticketmaster. Exactly. Um, so, basically, this was, like, the absolute worst ticket buying experience of my life. And it wasn't just for me. I mean, like, everyone, like, all on, all, every everyone in the office. I don't know anyone in the office that was able to get tickets. Mm -mm. Everyone all over social media was complaining about it. My TikTok was flooded with, like, people complaining about this experience. I mean, it was so bad. AOC tweeted at them. And the Department of Justice launched an investigation into Live yeah. Nation, which is Ticketmaster's parent company. They're going to court. Yeah, like. potentially. <laughs> and like Ticketmaster has for years had lawsuits like open against them for issues like this, usually for like bots and like scalpers and stuff like that, being mm -hmm. able to like get the tickets and sell them and potentially like withholding tickets. Um, but like this like got brought to the forefront because of the power of Taylor Swift and her fan base. Yeah. Like if Taylor, if the Swifties weren't like, passionate about this and like posting about it and like caring about it and if her demand for tickets hadn't been as high i mean like mm -hmm. they sent out an email that she would have had to perform for like two three and a half years to meet the demand of her tickets wow but like they knew that going into it you know what i mean so like yeah. how did they mess it up that bad and like exactly. that's what the department of justice will be looking into right but like it without her fans like that wouldn't have been possible for that to happen and yeah. it's hopefully going to fix that situation so it never happens to like another artist in the future. Right, that is crazy. Cause I mean, Ticketmaster is like, that's where you can, a lot of artists use, that's the only place where you can get tickets for yeah. their concerts. And they've been around for a while and you would just think that by now they would be able to make this whole process smooth. To me, honestly, it feels like a little bit of exploitation of fans just because yes, we are very passionate and a little bit crazy, but and so obviously we're going to do anything to get tickets for our favorites, but like that, we should not have, have to go to. through that. No. That is absolutely insane. Um, and there's got to be a way to fix that. Like it just, none of their explanations made sense to me. Right. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think that's, that's about everything. Yeah. So. Thank you so much for watching. To keep up to date with the series and see what guests we bring on next, make sure you follow us on all our social media at the agency at UF. And make sure to comment down below what fandoms that you're a part of and what fandoms you want featured on a future episode. And we'll try to get a fan from the office to come in and talk about it. Yeah. And that's today's fan take. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching. watching.